From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. It's been a busy week for the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office. Prosecutors charged former North Kingstown basketball coach Aaron Thomas, alleging inappropriate contact with students, but declined to press charges against a former chief of staff to Governor McKee in a controversial land deal. Plus, the AG released a policy proposal on police body-worn cameras and analyzed the state's concealed carry gun permit law following a Supreme Court decision. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi is off this week. Joining me to talk about that and I'll whole bunch more is the Attorney General for Rhode Island, Peter Narona. General, it's good to have you back on the program. As I said, it's been a busy week for your office. Yeah, it has. A little bit unusual uh, for us, busier than usual, but yeah, it's good to be here. Why don't we start with Aaron Thomas. Your office, as I said, charged former North Kingstown basketball coach Aaron Thomas with one count of second degree sexual assault and one count of second degree child molestation. He is accused of inappropriate contact with two former stu students during so-called naked fat tests that happened behind closed doors in his office. I interviewed you earlier this week about this, so, uh, so our viewers at home understand you will not comment on specifics of the Aaron Thomas investigation. Uh, but your office interviewed more than 30 people as part of this probe, and in our reporting, we know there are dozens of former students who say they've been subjected to these fat tests. Your case involves just two former students, and it is clear to me that the very short three-year statute of limitations for second-degree sexual assault prevented more charges here. That is my analysis, not yours. Um, but you tried to change that law, didn't you? I did, yeah. It's uh, something from our experience is really uh, an impediment to bringing, I'm speaking very generally here, to bringing cases where we think they could be brought. We've charged uh, 400 uh, sexual assaults against children over the last five years. Those are the ones we've been able to charge. We know that this is a ongoing problem and sometimes the statute of limitations can get in the way. We wanted to change it, we weren't uh, successful in getting it through the Senate this year, got it through the House, we'll be back next year trying to do it again. Do, do you know why you weren't successful in get it, getting it through the Senate? I don't. I mean, we advocated for it very strongly. Um, you know, whether they got caught up in other things, I can't say. You know, I'm not, I'm not in the meetings when things are decided as to what's going to go and what isn't, but I think this is a critically important issue for the people of the state of Rhode Island, and we have to get it done next year. I think I stepped on, on your answer there. You're going to try this again next legislative oh, session? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, we have, to, we have to get this fixed. Uh, we know that children don't um, come forward always uh, in the immediate aftermath of a sexual assault against them. Sometimes it takes years or decades for someone to come forward, and th that's perfectly understandable. But when you have a three-year statute of limitations where a sexual assault is committed um, on someone when they're 14 or over, uh, that makes it very difficult to bring those changes, to, to bring those charges. And look, the difference is, if you're before your 14th birthday, there's no statute of limitations. Right. So if that second incident, degree child molestation, second degree child molestation. So if that incident happens on your 14th birthday, you were shut off from justice. Uh, if we don't get there within three years, and so it's an important change that we need to make. Well, we should note that any change to the law would not be retroactive, so it would not have impacted the uh, the Aaron Thomas case. We should note Aaron Thomas's attorney said in a statement his client denies any criminal wrongdoing and the testing was solely to improve student athlete performance. Now Rhode Island has a duty to report law that requires all persons including personnel to report suspected child abuse to DCYF. Flags about Aaron Thomas were raised at least as far back as 2018 according to mm -hmm. our reporting but nothing truly was addressed until 2021 um, and you launched your investigation uh, last last fall. Did your, did your investigation look at culpability on the part of school officials at the time and is that still on the table? Yeah, look, it, it is. You know, I will point out, Tim, that it has a, that has a three-year three year statute of limitations as well. So I'm not suggesting by saying that that we have conclusively concluded whether there is a case there or not. We're still taking a look at that. And I know the U.S. Attorney's Office is also looking at institutional uh, and the institutional response. Can you use evidence the U.S. Attorney gathers? Yeah, look, you know, we share information all the time, and so, and, and across a lot of different kinds of cases. But look, you know, I think the statute of limitations is, is one of these things that I think can fly under the radar sometimes for the public. But when you're looking at, at uh, criminal misconduct, you've always got to be thinking about that statute of limitations because you've got to know, first of all, you've got to know how fast we've got to go, right? We don't want to lose a case right. because the statute's running even while we're investigating. So that is always in the back of our minds when we're investigating a case. But it also, you have to understand, we have to understand that even if we find criminal misconduct, we may not be able to bring it. So from an experienced prosecutor's perspective, you've always got the statute of limitations in your mind. You know what it is. You know how it's affecting potential charges, but you also know what your own deadline is. 
All right, I want to, uh, we may return to this topic, but we have so much to cover. I'm going to move on to Tony Silva. Your office declined to prosecute former Governor mm. McKee's chief of staff, but found his actions in trying to pressure state and local officials to greenlight a family development project on wetlands in Cumberland was um, improper, the, I believe uh, was the word you used. Um, you could have just said, look, no laws were broken and moved on. Yeah. But you issued a 22-page report, released all the investigatory materials. Those are on your website. We link through it on, in our story. Why did you do that? Look, I just think the public has a right to know, um, first of all, in terms of the materials, the public has a right to know, and frankly, they're apparable, as they should be. The public has a right to know uh, what we found in terms of... We should of, say apparable is our access to public records yes, act laws, so yes. people can uh, request public documents Correct. to get them. Yeah, so we know that the public is entitled to them ultimately, so there's no reason to hold them back, number one. Number two, um, I think that by putting those materials up there, it shows the depth of our investigation, that we were thorough, and I think that builds confidence not only in the work of the office, but in the system generally. I also but think, you also wanted to send a message about oh, this case. Well, yeah, and that's what I'm getting to. Look, I think, I think that it is incumbent on us particularly when we spend this much time on something. And we're looking at it through you know, a critical lens, meaning we're analyzing it very carefully. That it is incumbent on us to share with the public our view of what, what happened here. Because, as we say in the report, that the conduct of Mr. Silva, while not illegal, by uh, using his position of authority, um, gaining access that everyday renowners would not have, shakes confidence in the agency result. There are those who are always going to think that agency approval of that project was driven by something than the facts and the merits. Uh, I personally don't believe that, but there are going to be people who think that. Why? Because an insider had access. And so look, you know, we concluded that uh, Mr. Silva exercised poor, poor judgment by getting involved in a matter, a personal matter, when he had a high level, a high level authority position. Um, and my hope is that others will take note of that and perhaps act differently in the future. And that agency you refer to as the Department of Environmental Management. Right. Again, we have our full story on WPRI.com. I want to step back. Um, you know, this question is prompted by the Tony Silva investigation, but I want to step back from the specifics of that. You looked at, in that case, potential bribery, extortion, and ethics violation yes. charges. Uh, again, his actions did not cross that threshold in your analysis. So putting the case aside, there is a federal honest services charge, mm -hmm. which you, as a former U.S. attorney, you're well yeah. aware of. Does Rhode Island need better public corruption laws? Well, look, if you'd asked me that question a decade ago, I would have said yes. But the Supreme Court held uh, in the Skilling case that uh, even honest services fraud in the context of public corruption requires yeah. quid pro quo bribery or extortion. So you come back to the same kind of analysis. It's either got to be a threat or it has to be a payoff. Right? And so if you don't have those things, even under honest services fraud, as the Supreme Court has interpreted their statute, and I have to believe if Rhode Island had a similar statute, we'd end up in the same place, right. it doesn't really change. So if you've been doing this for a long time, as I have, you're always looking for the bribe or the threat. And if you don't find those things, you don't have a standard, typical corruption case. Ethics is a little more nuanced, but what ethics requires is you have an official position, okay? you have a personal matter, and your official position can tip the needle, if you will, from an official perspective on that personal matter. There's where you get into trouble under the ethics code. I want to move to body-worn cameras, police body-worn cameras. Your office, along with the state police, released draft regulations for police body-worn cameras. Every officer in the state will eventually be equipped with them, and there is now a formal public comment uh, period on the draft policy that you released. I want to look specifically at body camera video as a public record, mm -hmm. which they are. And your draft language put in the balancing language test that is in the APRA law we right. referenced earlier that would make the video exempt or subject to redaction if anything is personally identifiable. Does that, doesn't that just open the door for police departments to say no or claim it will cost so much to redact that video and it will be too expensive for, for anyone to get it? because. Everything in this video is personally identifiable, yeah. General. Well, that, that's, that's not how it's intended to be interpreted, and I don't think it'll be in, uh, interpreted that way. Look, we have to take into account privacy interests, you know, particularly for, you know, uh, for children and, and witnesses and others. So, so look, I think, I think the policy, the protocol, um, strikes the right balance. But look, that's the whole point of putting it out there for public comment. You know, it is a, still a work in progress, and if we take that 
take those public comments back in a way that we think require changes, and we'll do that. But look, it, it's going to be a balancing act. You know, I remember going through this, um, going through the policy the, or the, the regulations just within the last couple of weeks and asking some, some real questions as to how we're going to balance these things. It's, it's not going to be simple, but look, my position has always been to err on the side of release, and that's been true on everything we've handled in the office. That's, I think that's reflected in the rulings we've made under the open government laws, and I suspect in the end that's how this is going to be. Yeah, but too. you know these regulations will uh, live uh, longer than whatever, how long you serve, you're, you're seeking a second mm -hmm. term, and you know Attorney General Jane Doe or Attorney General John Doe might have a different uh, philosophy mm -hmm. than you, so that's why these things are yeah. so important. Agreed. Uh, granular question on this, look, if an arrest is made, Arrest reports, as you know, are a public record. Yep. Why wouldn't, and they're not subject to the balancing test, why wouldn't the video be part of the arrest report and be public? Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think because the, different, the difference is, is that even under the circumstances of an arrest report, sometimes those can be redacted as well. I, look, I think, I, and go back to your question about sort of what the next attorney general is going to do. My view is this, that if, um, and I, and I take this view with all of the work that we do in the office, whether it's building a stronger civil division or, or otherwise, it's very hard to undo the precedents that have been set by your, pre you know, by your predecessor. Sure, somebody could come in and do it totally differently, but the expectation is hopefully that you're going to follow, uh, uh, in areas of significant public importance, the work of your predecessor, because it makes sense, frankly, for you to do that. There's going to be, I think, a huge hue and cry if somebody were to come in and be less transparent than we've tried to be. And I hope that that will carry on to the next administration whenever that happens. All right, this is sort of a thick topic, but a, another important one, concealed carry permits for, for handguns. Uh, you decided Rhode Island's concealed carry gun laws are constitutional following a Supreme Court decision. Rhode Island is different in, than most yeah. states. It has, it has two laws, and so people understand towns, uh, usually through their police chief, can issue a concealed carry permit. Uh, what is key in that language is that the law says they shall issue the permit. You can, you can also, as Attorney General, issue these concealed carry permits, but the language for, that regulates you says may. This is important because the holding in, in that Supreme Court decision that I've referenced, New York versus Bruin, is a person does not have to show need to get a concealed carry permit. And that is true on the town level law right. in Rhode Island. But you do require to show need or you can require mm -hmm. that. Based on the holding in Bruin, how is that constitutional? Yeah, it's pretty simple, actually, and, and, the, and the holding makes that, in my view, makes that very clear. So the New York, uh, under the New York law, nobody, nobody in the state of New York could get a permit without showing need. In Rhode Island, everybody can by going to their city or town. So I want to say that again. In New York, nobody could get a permit without showing need. In Rhode Island, everyone can. That's the difference. And the court recognized that. When the court um, went through its decision, uh, they uh, discussed every single state's laws, and they took no issue with Rhode Island's laws. They took issue with six states in the District of Columbia, but not with ours. And so my view is this. In Rhode Island, every single Rhode Island resident, provided they pass a background check and meet some other criteria, can get a concealed carry permit without a showing of need. The law gives me a different standard. And here's the other thing, Tim. The General Assembly requires that I uh, ask for a showing of need before I can issue the permit. The alternative for me would have been to not issue permits at all, right? If, if I can't require someone to show need, now my ability to, to issue them at all under the Rhode Island statute is eliminated. And look, you know, it was clear to me that for us to get out of the permitting business would harm uh, individuals, not only individuals, the 97% of individuals who have applied for a permit with my office that have gotten them on a showing of need, who want them from my office for whatever reason, but also security uh, companies that have to come to me for open carry permits. I wouldn't be able so to license them. I'm so glad that you, was really important but I'm to me. I'm glad you said that. Isn't that the distinction between you and the state, uh, the, excuse me, the town level law, that your permit allows open carry. Sure, but the Supreme Court didn't say, didn't say you have a right to open carry. What they said was that you have a right to carry a concealed weapon. Rhode Island, you have that right by going to your city or town. New York, nobody had it. In Rhode Island, everybody has so it, you, and that's a distinction. You think if someone challenges your decision on this about the open carry permit um, based on the holding in Bruin, it, it's constitutional. I do, I do. Look. Look, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, we talked about this in the office, why it took us a little bit of time to put the guidance out. You know, the Supreme Court was plainly aware of Rhode Island's scheme. And the, uh, and the Rhode Island Supreme Court has also weighed in on this, on this, dual, uh, on this dual permitting uh, regime that we have and found there to be no problem. So, yes, I again, if, if you go through the Supreme Court decision carefully, as frankly we did in the office, what you see, whether it's in Alito's decision or in Kavanaugh's uh, decisions, which are concurrences or the main decision, 
uh, written by Judge Thomas, joined by Ju Justice Gorsuch. What you see is what they're saying is, in New York, you could only get it if you, shoot, if you mm. show need. In Rhode Island, that's not true, and therefore I think our statute is constitutional. We'll be challenged, I'm sure we'll be, but we're prepared to defend it. All right, we're gonna take a break on the program. When we come back, increased violence among feuding biker gangs. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi is off this week. Our guest is Rhode Island Attorney General Peter Narona. Uh, General, there has been an increase in violence among biker gangs in recent months, uh, both here and, and in southeastern Massachusetts. Your office put away the president of the Rhode Island chapters, uh, chapter of the Hells Angels, Joseph Lancia. It's a case I covered extensively. But, you know, violence is still going on, even though the, the head of the Hells yeah. Angels, at least in Rhode Island, is, is at the ACI. How concerned are you about what seems to be mounting tensions among outlaw motorcycle groups in the area. Yeah, concerned, along with the Rhode Island State Police and our federal partners are very concerned about it. Uh, and, and here's why, you know, and you've seen it in Rhode Island, there, is, there are oftentimes exchanges of gunfire among these individuals. And it, whether it's in the context of, of motorcycle gangs, outlaw motorcycle gangs, or it's in the context of, of street gangs in Providence, that is where my real concern lies in terms of the violence, uh, both among one another, obviously, but also, you know, innocent bystanders that get caught in a hail of bullets. And as, as we've seen, the widespread um, uh, use of illegal guns and high capacity magazines, and, and frankly, the willingness to use them to, mm -hmm. to indiscriminately put rounds in the air, it shouldn't come as a surprise that injuries and shooting deaths have been going up, uh, broadly speaking, over the last few years. So yeah, I'm very concerned about it. The good news is, is that the state police uh, intelligence unit is, is really on top of the activities of these gangs. And, and it's about, their work is about as good as you can get. And that Lancia case was a gun case. You, yeah, you yeah, sure. It's, it's all about the weapons Yeah, uh, in the hands of people who are willing to use them unlawfully. No question. All right, so a lot of people general are experiencing uh, sticker shock. I know I've received an email from Rhode Island Energy, which uh, used to be National Grid, about what we should expect in our household yeah. as far as increased electric rates. Uh, and it was no small increase, yeah. monthly increase that we saw here. So a lot of people at home are getting these emails and like I said, experiencing sticker shock. Is this something your office is watching and can intervene on potentially? Yeah, and look, how so? Yeah, look, so when we did our, when we intervened in the approval of the sale of National Grid to PPL, one of the things we were concerned about was DPUC left a lot of uh, rate relief on the table for Rhode Islanders. Uh, and we brought back $200 million of value there. But even at the time, I said when I was asked about increases in rates, we can ex expect them to go up uh, anyway. Here's why. Rates are combined from at least two sources. One are, one are the rates that uh, Rhode Island Energy can charge, or, as, or Grid could charge, from their delivery of the uh, energy itself. And that is what has been frozen, and that's where we got rebates in, in, our, in our intervention. But the, but the cost of energy that's coming to them from outside the state, they don't have any control over, and they can't profit from that. So what they say here- So meaning natural gas, say, to, that, that fuels the power plants, correct. that is much more expensive. Correct. And so what they say is, well, that's a pass-through cost. We can't profit from it. And that's true. We want to make sure that we're verifying that. You know, to be candid, the track record, as we've seen among energy companies here in Rhode Island, has not been great lately. We've seen that in a couple of instances. We've intervened in a couple of other cases. So we're going to watch this and look at this very carefully to make sure that this is, um, is no worse than it needs to be. But we all recognize that today, cost of energy are going up. We gotta make sure that we are minimizing that to every extent possible. And that's why it was so important for us, for our, in my view, to intervene in the PPL transaction, because as I said, DPUC left at least $200 million on the table there that we were able, we were able to get back for Rhode Islanders. Do you have a sense as to timing, meaning they, they have to, you say that's DPUC, that, that's a regulatory Correct. agency that uh, governs all this, um, when this will be, go before them for approval? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that yet. And it may be the PUC, in fact, that has to weigh in on this. You know, that's what we're getting into you know, in the last uh, 24 hours or so, and I expect to have more on that in the next, uh, by early next week. The Supreme Court overturned Roe, um, as everyone knows. It has little mm -hmm. effect here in Rhode Island, which has a state law protecting a woman's access to abortion. In other words, yeah. R Rhode Island codified Roe. But we are seeing some states that will criminally charge a doctor in another state if one of their residents gets an abortion out of state. If a state seeks to criminally charge a doctor in Rhode Island, can you step in? Well, look, you know, they would, they would certainly likely need my cooperation to do that, and I'm not gonna provide it, you know, frankly. 
um, you know, I think that would be an overstepping of, of another state's authority to try to do anything with respect to anything that anyone is doing in the state of Rhode Island. You know, you hear those states that are thinking about that, talk about state rights, states' rights a lot. We have our own states' rights here in Rhode Island, and I'm going to do everything I can to protect them. You know, I have, I'm married to a doctor who mm. counsels women on, re, on their reproductive health. Um, so this, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with her over the years about this topic and others. I'm going to do everything I can to protect a woman's right uh, to make choices about her reproductive, reproductive health here in the state of Rhode Island. I'm committed to doing that, and uh, there's nothing I won't do to, to, try, to, to try to protect uh, women and uh, those who provide reproductive health care for them. You know, we've talked about a couple of big uh, Supreme Court cases. Uh, they, usually the big ones come out in June, and that's why we're talking about them. I, I assume you disagree with the holding in Dobbs, which is the one that overturned yeah, Roe. I assume I you disagree with the holding in Bruin. Uh, yeah, look, I the think handgun one. Yeah, look, I think I disagree with them for different reasons. I think certainly Roe, um, simply by overturning that precedent that it existed for 50 years, multi generations of women and and men, but women principally, um, that was a a huge sea change that um, I think shakes confidence in the court. Bruin is a hard case, frankly, for me to follow in terms of relying only on history to try to understand what we should be able to do today. Well, it, and I don't want to analyze that case, but what I, I guess my question is, with a, with a supermajority of conservatives on the Supreme Court, because President Donald Trump got a stunning three yeah. picks in, in just one term, some Democrats, including Congressman David Cicilline, have supported it, expanding the court, which critics yeah. call court packing. Mm -hmm. Do you support or oppose that? Yeah, look, I haven't really thought that through. The, the danger for me is, you know, when the Democrats, you know, control the Congress and the, and the White House, they pack it and they expand it. And then when the Republicans control it, they expand it again. And where does it all end? Look, I think this is, though, why, um, this is why um, the choices we make about who's going to represent us really matter. I try to stick in my job to the law um, as, I, as I have to apply it. But I will tell you, both of those cases really shook my confidence uh, in the Supreme Court. And it's, an, it's an analysis. Look, there are over 30 pages of history in Bruin. I'm not sure that history is the way to define the Constitution. Um, that said, when I'm in my official capacity... So you're not an originalist? I am not. But when, I'm, when I am working in the office and trying to find what I think the law requires, I read those cases, cases carefully, I try to divine what the Supreme Court means and apply that in an objective legal way, and that's how we try to do the job here. Shifting gears, my colleague Steph Machado reported this week that uh, Providence right now is installing a couple dozen license plate reader cameras throughout the city like, like they have yeah. in Cranston. These are cameras that take a picture of every car that passes by and if police are looking for a bad guy or a stolen mm -hmm. car, they have this massive database that they can comb through. Do you support them? Yeah, look, I think they're a useful law enforcement tool and we've seen that in some of the cases that we're making right now and we are proactively going after people putting illegal guns on the streets, making them, straw purchasers, people who are making ghost guns, putting them out there. We have been able to use some of that technology to track down people uh, involved in violent crime. So look, there's a benefit to law enforcement, no question about it. They can help keep Rhode Islanders safer. We also, though, have to balance the use of that material. So look, I understand the concerns from a big brother, if you will, perspective. Um, I think, though, that from what I've seen, the policies in place balance that in a way that protects public safety but also protects privacy. So you feel confident there are safeguards in there if a police officer wants to find out if their significant other is cheating on them? Yeah, look, and, and they can look at this database and pull up their sure. that car? Yeah, look, look, there are procedures in place for that already. So, for example, we know every time somebody runs a plate in the state of Rhode Island, we know that. Law enforcement knows that. He has a fingerprint for the police officer that Correct. does it. So that person better have an explanation as to why they're running that plate. So, look, it's not, this is a different form of the same thing. We have to be careful here, but it is a very useful law enforcement tool, no question. So you are, believe it or not, ending the... Your first term. I am. It's I don't know where the time went. <laughs> I, I hear you. Uh, and uh, it's a four-year term. You are running again, as I said earlier in the program. What has surprised you most about your first term in office? Uh, you know, I, I would say the opportunities we had on the civil division side if we chose to use them. You know, we had a lot of tools in the toolbox we weren't using, doing health care better, doing consumer protection better, doing environmental protection better. I think the only thing that I don't want to say it surprised me, but, but I have been very pleased with is the dedication of the men and women of the office who work really hard every day to try to do the right thing. I was there, as you know, a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, and I frankly had forgotten, uh, in a way, uh, just how strong an office it is. I think it's stronger. I think we have recruited some really good people there that are delivering results for the people of the state. One thing I learned when I was U.S. Attorney, Tim, was it takes time to build an organization that can put into place the vision that you want to bring to it. 
Uh, we're certainly doing that now, and I think this week, frankly, with all the work that we've been talking about today and all through this week, really reflects that. Yeah, we've been talking a lot on this program about you know criminal cases so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You just sort of touched on it there in your civil division. Um, is that, to you, the busiest uh, division of, of your agency, or what, what do people need to know about the civil division? Look, I think that's the biggest change. You know, when we got there, when I, got, when I took office, we were mostly a defensive shop defending the state and its, and its workers. I really wanted to pivot us to being more active and to be on offense. And what did that mean? It meant doing healthcare in a different way. Don't check the boxes. Get into a healthcare transaction and understand what it means for Rhode Islanders, and if necessary, take action to protect them. Environmental protection, doing very little there. We're doing a lot more now. Going after polluters, making sure the public has access to the Consumer protection, we got our statute changed so we could go after car dealers that were, in my view, were ripping off our dollars in a way we couldn't do that before. 20 seconds left. Yeah, so, so to me that's the biggest change. The criminal division is doing great work, but that's work we've always done, doing it differently and going after violent crime. But the whole thing for me has been take, um, get out on offense. Don't let the work come to you. Attorney General Peter Narona, thanks for joining us on the program. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.